Um, geez, I had a couple of things I was going to start off with. So I'm going to tell you about the music, uh, tell you a story about a very brief, very brief story about a church I was a member of for a while. And uh, the pastor got carried away one night. He used to interrupt the song leader. Song leader, whom I knew from seminary, spent a lot of time developing the music program and all that. Very conscientious about it. Very, well, there's more to that story. But one night, uh, the pastor said, uh, came over and he took the hymnal away from the song leader and he started leading the singing. You know, it was just, well, it's a Baptist church, so it was really roustrous. And, uh, and then he gave it back, sat down. They went through the rest of the music program. <laughs> and the uh, pastor got up to speak. Music director came over and edged him out of the way, and he preached. <laughs> it wasn't planned. <laughs> um, I have mixed feelings about this title. Um, Roger gave me this title, and, of course, he wanted, I think you saw up there, um, using, it should be the historical Jesus as the gold standard for determining what is Christian or something like that. Well, first of all, gold standard, I had some problems with that. I, I know it's an economic term, and I know that one time the U.S. was on the gold standard, uh, was on the silver, uh, gold standard, and we shifted to the silver standard. Now, all I could make out of that was the gold standard was supposed, at least in my title, the gold standard was supposed to be better and the silver standard was not quite as good. So, uh, but then if you look at my title, I'm not sure I agree with what I'm supposed to talk about <laughs> because um, determining what is Christian. You see, neither Jesus nor his earliest followers were Christian. And if you're using the historical Jesus for determining uh, what the gold standard is, it ain't going to turn out Christian. Or so it seems to me. Uh, you can bl blame Roger for that. So with those disclaimers, um, I will begin here. Uh, actually, few modern religious leaders in the, in the Christian tradition would agree uh, with the idea that the historical Jesus ought to be the standard for determining how the religious life ought to be lived because the Christian church today bases its faith on the gospel and on the, um, uh, and on the Christian tradition. What my title calls for is for us to establish the standard, if I may put it this way, on the shifting sands of critical scholarship. Now the sands are shifting, folks. They go this and that way. And you never know where they're going to land. Um, in, in academia, in my field, um, what is true lasts until a better argument comes along. And people will very quickly abandon certain uh, ways or certain arguments or certain ideas or certain established things that were thought to be the assured results of criticism because the assured results of criticism get overturned rather frequently. The historical Jesus as a standard for how one ought to live one's religious life <clears throat> disregards both of the uh, gospel and the, uh, and the religious and the Christian tradition. The idea of a historical Jesus as opposed to a Christ of faith or Jesus Christ uh, emerged from the recognition that the, uh, the Gospels aren't reliable, historically, if I can put it that way. The evangelists, true enough, used traditional material. That means that they didn't, so we think today, they didn't invent everything that came to them. They received uh, disparate parts of an oral tradition, which they had the problem of putting in some kind of an order, they chose to put it in the story because they were talking about Jesus of Nazareth and the Gospel of Mark. To Mark goes the credit for putting these disparate pieces of tradition into a narrative form. He begins his Gospel with this statement, the beginning of the Gospel about 
Jesus Christ. That's my translation of that particular genitive arrangement. Beginning the gospel about Jesus Christ, and then he proceeds to tell the story. So in a sense, the gospels are not the sources for the historical Jesus. They are the first attempts to arrive at who the historical Jesus was. And as, as David told you um, in, in the tape, these things don't agree. I mean, if you take them and get yourself a gospel, a gospel synopsis and go through the gospel synopsis where you've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, rarely John, because there ain't much in John that is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But when you do Matthew, Mark, and Luke, geez, do they change the tradition. They put things in different contexts. Mark, we think, is the basis for the other two. But that may not necessarily be so because the shifting sands of scholarship have shifted and shifted and shifted. And so at any time in the history of scholarship, one of the other two might have been the source for uh, the other two. The, the gospel writers are really not historians. They are theologians. They did not sort out his, the historical from the romantic and the mythical and the ecclesiastical. Um, and, and when I say they're not historians, they really, the argument goes sometimes that, that they work like ancient historians, and well, maybe they did, but we have a different standard of what it means, of what historical means today. They did not work um, in the best, um, with the best techniques of a modern historian. They aimed to show that the gospel was geared in one particular person, Jesus of Nazareth, <clears throat> and that um, he is the framework for where what the church preached uh, and the basis of what the church preached. It sort of suggests that the church was aware that it had gotten a little away from its roots. There have been three quests of the historical Jesus, uh, if you discount the gospels, what they call the old quest, the new quest, and evangelical scholars establish what they call the third quest. I read something the other day where they were calling the third quest to be closed. I'm not sure what that means. I, I'll have to find out. It began with a man by the name of David Friedrich Strauss. He was a writer in antiquity, and what he sought to show was that uh, what you have in the Gospels is uh, sacred history. And sacred his histories used myth by his definition, because there are a lot of definition, definitions of myth, in order to cast Jesus as a, uh, actually in mythical garb as a mythical figure. So you're not getting the real Jesus in that. Uh, Herman's, uh, this was in, forgot the date, 17 something or other. So it's, it goes back a long way, 123 years for the old quest. Uh, Herman Samuel Rimaris uh, wrote, uh, and uh, actually he didn't let his works be published until after his death. And one of the things you ought to look at sometime, which is in, uh, in English translation, is the aims of Jesus and his disciples. And what he sought to show, uh, and he did, that what Jesus talked about ain't what the disciples talked about, or the apostles, or his followers. Jesus talked about the imminence of the kingdom of God, and the disciples talked about and proclaimed Jesus as the Son of God. Oh, that's, that's very different, I mean, if you stop and think about it. The old quest concluded in the 20th century. Um, uh, uh, Albert Schweitzer wrote a book. The title of his book was The Quest of the Historical Jesus in English Translation. But the German title was From Rimaris to Vreda. And what he set to do was to trace his 123 years of scholarship uh, talking about all the lives of Jesus that were done, critical lives of Jesus. That's what he's talking about. There are many more of these things, I suppose. And uh, it, it's an incredible experience. It's 19th century English, okay, but if you sit down and read it, you will, you will be shocked at, uh, at uh, 
how many ways there are to picture Jesus using the Gospels. Um, what Schweitzer's uh, writer's book was in 1901, uh, uh, Schweitzer's book was in 1906. Uh, what Vreda said was, I didn't tell you the title of his book, The Messianic Secret in the Gospels. Um, what he showed was the messianic secret, that is where Jesus tries to keep his identity secret when he heals someone or when he drives out an evil spirit or tells people not to tell anybody about this. He showed that that was not Jesus' secret, that was Mark's secret, okay? When uh, Schweitzer wrote, he went through the material, what everybody had said, and he said, no, 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 it's historical. What you have in the Gospels is history. Here's where we wound up. This is, uh, this is the conclusion of Schweitzer's uh, historical search for Jesus, thinking that this was history. There's silence all around. The Baptist, John the Baptist, appears and cries, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Soon after that comes Jesus, and in the knowledge, he sort of knows who he is, that he is the coming Son of Man, lays hold on the wheel of the world to set it moving on that last revolution which is to bring all ordinary history to a close. It refuses to turn. He throws himself on it. And then it does turn and crushes him. Instead of bringing the eschatological conditions into play, he has destroyed them. The wheel rolls onward and the mangled body of the one immeasurably great, human ma uh, great man who was strong enough to think of himself as the spiritual ruler of all mankind and to bend history to his purpose is hanging upon it still, thinking of the modern church. That is his victory, and that is his reign. After Schweitzer wrote, everybody noticed uh, the problem. There was not a single life, critical life of Jesus, written for half a century. No scholar turned his hand to write a life of Jesus. In 1956, another German scholar, Gunther Bornkamm, wrote Jesus of Nazareth. It wasn't the life of Jesus or anything like that. But he began his study with this amazing sentence, no one is any longer in a position to write a life of Jesus. And here is why. This is, what, this is his explanation. Mathematical certainty in the exposition of a bare history of Jesus, unembellished by faith, is unattainable. We possess no single word of Jesus and no single story of Jesus, no matter how incontestably genuine they may be, which do not embody at the same time the confession of the believing congregation, or at least is embedded therein. This makes the search after the bare facts of history difficult and to a large extent futile. But then he wrote, <laughs> then he wrote Jesus of Nazareth. Well, you have to, have to think about that. But he, 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 didn't, uh, he didn't do it as a life of Jesus. I'll get to what he did in a minute, and I would like to uh, but counter what he said. It is not futile if you have some way of sorting out with some degree of critical confidence um, as a historian things that Jesus possibly said from things that Jesus probably said. Okay? Um, it appears that possibility is not quite you don't have this quite a high of confidence in possibility as you have in probability. Maybe it's how many angels dance on the head of a pin, I don't know. But at least many of us feel that it, uh, let me phrase it a little different way. If you are able to sort out things that were attributed to Jesus erroneously from things that he probably said, hey, that's... That's an enterprise worth engaging in, it seems to me. Because we know that there are things in the New Testament attributed to Jesus that Jesus did not say. Now, 
Scholarly techniques vary widely, and scholars are variously optimistic or pessimistic about the results of what they write about. I, I know that um, when we were in the Jesus Seminar trying to sort out the sayings, we had one scholar uh, who said, uh, who voted everything black. Does that, anybody, uh, how many of you know the way the Jesus Seminar worked? Red, pink, gray, black? Red, Jesus said it, pink, um, sure sounds like Jesus. Gray, uh, there's been some mistake here. Black, he didn't say it, okay? And so we went through that exercise using, at Bob Buck's insistence, the, uh, the dramatic beads at the end of every discussion, debate about a saying or what have you. We'd pass around the beads and you would put in your pink, your red, your gray, your black. Uh, about him, he said, everything is black. About me, when I started the enterprise, um, I was pretty optimistic. It was always, you know, kind of red and pink, maybe an occasional gray. Black, I stayed away from. But the longer I listened to the, the discussions, the more it became apparent to me that not everything attributed to Jesus, Jesus said. And so my colorings got increasingly gray or black. I was becoming, I think, marginally so perhaps, a critical historian. The enduring legacy of Schweitzer's book showed that by using, by using the Gospels to write a life of Jesus, any life could be written, and was. Go read Schweitzer's book. Um, and then it could be deconstructed by using the same Gospels. So you have to stop and think, whoa, wait a minute here. Since World War II, several things have become apparent um, and known about the Jesus tradition. You might call them, I hesitate to call them the critical results. They're virtually all negative, but there's some things we, we agree on, I think, in general, a critical scholar. A critical scholar is one who makes a judgment um, based not on faith, but what the evidence shows and follows the evidence. No outline of the life of Jesus came to those who wrote the Gospels, to Mark goes that credit. Mark put it all together. It's Mark's fiction. It is. The fiction means a, uh, a, represent, a representation. It's Mark's story, if you'd prefer a different word. Miracle stories reflect what I would call mythical Christology or um, uh, what an earlier scholar would have called sacred history. You're dealing with sacred history. You're not dealing with uh, a historical narrative, if I can put it that way. That's, and that's not to say that we don't have historical information in the Gospels, but the Gospels themselves, as they're done, are not history in a modern sense. Okay, There are more sacred history, more like sacred history. The passion narrative in Mark uh, is... A romantic fiction it didn't happen that way. It's either by Mark or someone earlier, because Mark, Mark put all of that together. Nevertheless, the spate of lives of Jesus continues, even today, today in ecclesiastical, in uh, uh, evangelical camps, and even in, yes, I dare say it, critical camps. Um, what is left to Jesus, all that's left to Jesus, if you're a very critical historian, are his sayings and his stories. Maybe an event or two. It depends on where you come uh, on the uh, chopping scale. I would probably say certain events, I don't even say life, I would say the public career of Jesus uh, might be his baptism by John. That is probably assured. And one reason, of course, is that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And who was the most famous person he baptized? Yeah, Jesus. Um, and perhaps the cleansing of the temple and the crucifixion, of course. I'm not sure that anybody challenges that. Maybe I'm wrong. 
Uh, the social contexts of the sayings that you have in the Gospels were invented by the evangelists, or maybe invented by Mark and adapted and changed by uh, Matthew and Luke. How did all this come about that the Gospels themselves should be so regarded? Um, first of all, uh, the New Testament itself, as David said on the tape, is really a creation of modern scholars. Because if you want to go back behind, the, uh, let's just take the Gospels, okay? Because you can do, the, do it with the rest of them too. But if you want to go, if you want to uh, go back behind the Gospels, what you've got are individual manuscripts, over 5,000. I think David said 560. That was a new number to me. I always say over 5,000 because they're discovering these manuscripts uh, almost every day. No two of them agree in alike, agree alike in all particulars. He said something about sentences. Does anybody? No one's sentence is the same in all. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that because I haven't checked it. Do you suppose he checked it? Yes. The other one, no two of them agree alike in all, all particulars. I'm fairly uh, confident about that. 5,000 manuscripts. We don't have a complete text of any of that stuff until the 4th and 5th centuries. And modern scholars have gone and taken all of the papyrus fragments and they've looked at the modern texts and, you know, and they've come up with a critical text that <laughs> we more or less agree on. Um, gospel writers drew on an anonymous oral reports. An anonymous oral report was not remembered because a person had a historical interest but, it, I mean, who was Jesus? He was sort of nobody in antiquity. It was remembered because it was significant for the faith of the individual. And then they modified the stuff. The transmitters did as it was passed on down. Uh, you can run that test yourself, you know. The, the old whisper game with everybody tr trying to be true and do it uh, actually uh, honestly you still get changes. It happens inevitably because we don't remember verbatim. I did have a friend in seminary who had a verbatim memory. Hated the guy, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Actually, he was a good friend of mine. But. And the evangelists, when they got it, they adjusted it. The book, uh, someone asked about Bart Ehrman's book, Misquoting Jesus. He exhaustively showed the, uh, the changes the scribes have made. Little, some of them for faith reasons, some of them because of mistakes, and you can go on down the tattoo, okay, of the kinds of things that happen when, when they're making changes. But at bottom, everything, everything is based on hearsay. That's what we mean by oral reports, because there are no names associated with those reports, and you can't go back and check them. Um, and it's kind of a position we've been driven to. We've got the Gospels we think were written at the uh, latter half of the first century, and Jesus lived, dates I would give it, 26 uh, to 36. How, do, how did the Gospel writers get all that information? In some cases, they had sources, say, for example, like... Uh, Matthew and Luke use the Gospel of Mark. Um, and in that case, we know how they changed. Get yourself a Gospel synopsis and read Mark and then check the other two. Occasionally, John will be put in there. So how would you go about sorting sayings as to originality? Now, I, I can't, that, that's a separate lecture, and it's almost a workshop kind of thing. You've got to try it yourself to, to think of it. Uh, um, that, that it really works, and maybe it doesn't work, but some of us think it, do. it does. Here, here's one, it's called the criterion of dissimilarity or distinctiveness. It, it kind of works on the basis of logic, okay? Now I should warn you that the Jesus that you get by applying this criterion will not be a characteristic Jesus, it will not even be the whole man, but it will, think, think with me for a moment, of a man that you draw in bubbles, you know, like that. And so it's in the shape of man and everything is filled in. And what happens when you apply this criterion of, distinct, uh, of, of distinctiveness or dissimilarity 
is that you're going to take huge chunks out of that, of that picture. So you wind up <laughs> kind of with a man full of holes because you've eliminated a lot of things that have been attributed to him. But here's, how the, here's the logic of it. <clears throat> uh, here is a saying that is attributed to Jesus. Truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, uh, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now Jesus, of course, spoke Aramaic, we think. He may have known a few words of Greek, but I'm not convinced that he was a Greek linguist. An iota is a Greek letter, and a hook may be a breathing mark over a, uh, a Greek word. Could be an iota subscript, something to that effect, so they, they look like hooks. Um, did Jesus say that? Well, maybe. It's possible, right? I mean, Jesus was a Jew. The law was very important to Jews. Sure, it's possible he said that. Uh, but you know, there were Jewish Christians that believed in the permanence of the law. I'll go to Paul's letter to Galatians. Now, is it possible that something Jesus said issued in such a statement being attributed to him? Is it possible? If you admit that it is possible, then you've got a conundrum, because the conundrum is, how do you know which source to track it to? Distinctiveness says, sayings and parables may be regarded as originating uh, with Jesus if they are dissimilar to, and this is the uh, uh, important word, characteristic emphases in Judaism and Christianity. So for me, I'd vote, vote black on that saying. I wouldn't even vote uh, gray on that saying. What you're trying to do is to sort out the possible from the probable. I'm looking for things Jesus probably said as opposed to things Jesus possibly said. What about the uh, resurrection predictions where Jesus predicts that he's going to die and then be raised again in the Gospel of Mark. Three times in Mark. I think the others would have two, maybe one of them only one. I don't recall offhand right now. <coughs> Did Jesus say that? I'd say it's possible, but not probable, because the resurrection is the thing in traditional Christianity that you don't have Christianity without the resurrection. So I would eliminate those and vote black on those as well. Now what have you done? Have you proven Jesus didn't say those things? No, you haven't proven that. Uh, but you've, what you've proven is that you've got possible different origins for the saying. And what you are trying to do is to rule out one as more probable and less probable. And this criterion decides if, it's, if it is a Characteristic emphasis, you eliminate it. The most complete sifting of the sayings of Jesus, uh, this has been going on since the turn of the century, okay? Well, the turn of last century. Um, so it's been going on a long time. The most complete sifting is the uh, report of the Jesus Seminar, The Five Gospels. How many of you know this book? How many of you don't know this book? My better way. Okay. You need to, I'll, I'll leave it up here and you can take a look at it. And don't you take it because it's my personal copy and I've got, I've got signatures in the back, okay? <laughs> uh, but you can look to see what they do. They give you every saying of Jesus and they describe the rationale that Funk and Roy Hoover thought the seminar worked on the basis of to vote it red, pink, gray, or black. I passed out to you a list, oh, we st I should say that we started in 1985 and went to 1993. I wasn't an active, uh, as active in the Axe Seminar, I'm a little bit more skeptical about uh, uh, drumming up criteria to sort those kinds of things out. Now what, what I've given you there are selected sayings out of the 18% that the Jesus Seminar argued as coming from Jesus of Nazareth. Sounds terrible, doesn't it? 18%? Jeez, of, of 100%. That means what? Who's quick on the math? Pardon? One in five? Um, so let's see. Um, 
But now stop and think a minute. You had the most critical people in the country there. Anybody could come and put in their two cents at the table, but the problem was you didn't get any preference. You might have been a high and, high and mighty uh, uh, seminar, seminary professor from such and such, and such a college, but what the saying rose or fall on the basis of the evidence you threw on the table. And you had to convince your colleagues of your position. So you were working with critical historians. What that means is we got 18% of sayings that probably came from Jesus. Now I must caution you at this point. If you read through my sayings, you're going to discover some things about them. But you may discover you don't particularly care for this fellow. Yeah, man, that's a problem. Um, uh, I don't include the stories there. Uh, that's, a, that's a very special problem. You'd have to look at my book on uh, parables, but stories don't give you anything, the parables don't give you anything religious. As I said this morning, everything, except for one or two stories uh, where uh, you have the temple playing a role in a Pharisee and uh, a tax collector and you get a little bit of religion in the trappings of the story. But the rest of it, guys, every interpreter has brought, uh, has e evoked by inference a uh, religious message out of the stories. Basically, they're simply secular stories. They're not religious at all. So I, I can't address that here. Um, but the sayings, the sayings that we've isolated give little practical advice about getting on in the world. How are you supposed to comport your life? What is religious? What is not religious? Uh, whatever the grand scheme in Jesus' head may have been, the residue of his sayings called them at one time quips, aphoristic sayings, um, give you, uh, provide you nothing more than, than hints. Uh, here are two comments by Bob Funk. It, uh, it's a source of constant bewilderment and frustration that Jesus had so little to say by way of explicit direction for getting on in the world. And another comment, Jesus chose not to be explicit Rather, he indulged in hyperbole, irony, and metaphor where he might have been more lucid in teaching his listeners to live wisely and judiciously insofar as Jesus' teachings are honored to, uh, to be honored as the ground rules for a Christian ethic, reinterpretation, manipulation, and supplementation seemed not only to be permitted but actually required. I want to give you a quick run through of five sayings. I'm going to really very quickly go through this, make a little argument, and see where we wind up. Matthew 10:16 reads in most of your translations, "Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves." The terms used uh, here, innocent and wise, in the ancient world are positive. They are positive character traits. Sh uh, wise, shrewdness and prudence. Well, that's pretty good. You want your kids to be that way. Innocent, candor and purity. That's pretty good too. Honesty and so on. But when you mix these things with snakes and doves slash pigeons, it comes out a little different. And my translation of that is be sly as snakes and gullible as pigeons. It is an aphorism that is at once a paradox. And a paradox, of course, is an absurd statement that you think is made for a particular, hopefully, I guess, for a particular a productive purpose. An aphorism is a brief saying, a pithy statement, that when you hear it, you say, what was, run that one by me again, what, what, what was that? You have to think about it in order to get, you have to wrap your mind around it. This, this may be one of those. I would call, call it more, um, I would call this one more a paradox because you can't be both literally at the same time. You can't be sly and gullible at, at, at an instant, you know. They're, they're, they're quite different. You can't take it literally, it seems to me. 
uh, something else must have been going on. Now, I, don't, I, I really can't tell you because I didn't see into his head. I don't read minds in any case, anybody's mind. I'm always suspicious when people tell me what somebody is thinking or tell me what characters in the, in the New Testament are thinking. Uh, one thing you can be sure of, this is not the language of the apocalyptic prophet and it is not the language of the moral teacher. A moral teacher would say, you do this and this is what God expects of you. An apocalyptic prophet would say, uh, you terrible sinners, get your life right because God is returning even as we speak. So what does that say about the nature of the character of Jesus? Not apocalyptic prophet. This one saying, not apocalyptic prophet and not a moral teacher. What am I supposed to do with it? How am I going to inculcate, that's a good word, into my life? How does it help me with getting on in the world? And Jesus is silent. Second one. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now in the first century Palestine, this would be a politically explosive statement. The emperor and the representatives of the emperor would say, right on man, that's, uh, that's what you're supposed to do. Give Caesar his due. The political zealots in Palestine whose motto was the sword and not sparingly, no king but the Lord. Kick all these guys out, uh, these overlords that we've got, uh, would not be happy with it. Uh, all specifics are lacking, however, so the question becomes, how are we going to divvy up, uh, divvy up our beads? We'll use beads. How do we divvy up our beads? Which, one does, which ones does God get? Which ones does Caesar get? Now, in the story, I mean, you've got the denarius, you've got Caesar's coin, you give Caesar his coin, but what Jesus said was, give Caesar what's his, and God's what's his, and that's the red saying. Got a very high percentage of red among the fellows. They thought he said it. Um, but you have to allocate between God and Caesar. You have to make the decision as a guide for determining the relationship of one's religious obligations to God and to the state, hey, it fails. It doesn't really help me to know where I put the dividing line. That's left up to you. You have to draw the dividing line. Here's another one. Love your enemies. Uh, that's, that's a good one. Uh, maybe Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, all Jews were saying it, and certainly possible that he might have put two and two together and uh, broadened the concept, and maybe even in early Christianity broadened the concept. And so not, as in Jewish tradition, it's not just your neighbor or your fellow Israelite, but it's those that don't have the same sexual preferences. It's those that, uh, that are not the same color as you, that don't uh, come from the same a similar background as you do. But love your enemies as a rule, what does that mean? Does it mean you're supposed to love someone who has made it his or her aim in life to destroy you? That's kind of what an enemy is. I mean, they don't like you. They want to do away with you. That's, uh, that's a dangerous idea to love your enemies. By the way, I should say, I was the one that made the presentation, presentation for this argument of the Jesus Seminar that this came from Jesus, because I don't know of any other tradition in antiquity, there may be some, I'm not infallible, that says love your enemies. Okay? And every time early Christianity used this saying, they sort of hedged their bets. I think they kind of knew that this was a totally undermining saying, and so when you find it, it's kind of modified and domesticated. So in Luke 6, 27, 28, there's several times the saying appears, and this is only one instance. But I say to you that here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. Well, I can do most of that stuff. 
And in fact, I have done, Roger's done some of this stuff. <laughs> Do good to those who hate you. Shake, shake your head, yes, okay. <laughs> bless, those who cur- bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. But love your enemies? What happens when the welfare of family and friends and enemies clash? It ain't possible to love all equally, it seems to me. Here is the problem. Loving your enemy can get your friend killed. And how is it loving your friend to allow your friend to be killed? How is one supposed to reasonably and rationally locate oneself on this saying, on the landscape of this saying? And Jesus says, love your enemy. Luke 6, 29 To him who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your outer garment, do not withhold even your undergarment. My translation. This saying endorses passive resistance to attacks against your person and property, and quite frankly, goes against the normal drive for self-survival. How can one follow this literally, and continue to survive in the world as, a, as an independent, free human being. Is it a good rule for nations? Do we put, you know, do we love the Al-Qaeda? Well, Jesus said, love your enemies. But Jesus never clarifies or specifies. He never says how we're supposed to accomplish this and to and still continue uh, living any kind of a normal life. The Gospel of Thomas overlaps with the Synoptic Gospels in many sayings, and it has other sayings that come elsewhere from elsewhere in the ancient world. And there's one saying that uh, did get a red vote. There, there, there are more <laughs> red sayings in the Gospel of Thomas than there are in the Gospel of John from the Jesus Seminar. Those who go hungry to feed the starving belly of another are blessed. Sets a very high standard, it seems to me, for feeding the hungry. You go hungry to feed them. You see somebody hungry, you take the food off your table and you give it to them and let your belly grumble. And what then? How far do we take it? Do I feed every hungry person that I see? Every hungry person that I know? Well, the hungry are always with us. And the problem it raises is this. Do I feed myself enough sustenance just to stay alive, and so I feed the hungry? Or must I join the ranks of the starving to be favored? Uh, But Jesus is silent. Must I exhaust my resources and become like the homeless on the street? Or maybe a more practical question is, how in the world do I continue to enjoy my comfortable lifestyle and obey this saying? But Jesus doesn't clarify. The wisdom in Jesus' sayings are not esoteric. They don't speculate about God as some of the texts that we have Uh, in the Nagamati Library. They're not practical. They're not giving you a guide for life in this world. Rather, they are an uncompromising, radical ethic. In fact, some of the sayings, if you look through the list, some of the sayings that we determined Jesus said, you have to shake your head and say, what's that got to do with anything, you know? Um, or some of the things that have flown under the highfalutin title of aphorism, meaning it is a saying that makes you think about it and there's really a a moral purpose to it, looks like, in some cases, just pure to old, common, um, uh, uh, what's the word I want, tradition, uh, common lore, if I can put it like that. An ethic, uh, however, that's lived under the imperial rule of God while living in the imperial rule of Rome in Jesus' day. So it's a radical ethic while living in two worlds. In other words, what you have to do is to take the radical ethic of Jesus 
and you have to balance it with how are you going to live in the world. You have to make the decision. How, how are you going to do that? Learning how to responsibly balance the obligations of both, if I can put it that way, is the essence of wisdom. All Jesus gives you is a radical ethic with no explanation or rationale. So how does one handle such demanding radical ideas? Do we follow them or do we domesticate them? Modern churches domesticate Actually, the gospel writers have domesticated them. Jesus kind of got lost in the... Uh, in the uh, mish and mash of the writers. Um, okay, and that brings me then to my, am I still on time? What time am I done? Somebody got the schedule? Ah, got to do this quickly then. I won't be able to do it all, but I can get most of it done. I've got about 10 minutes. Roger's not here to tell me to stop, so now I'll just keep talking. <laughs> Um, actually, you, oh, he came back. I knew he would. Um, I've got 10 minutes. So I think I've got 10 minutes. You agree? Yes. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'll live within that. You really don't have any choice, guys. You have to develop your own database of Jesus sayings that most probably originated with him. You've got to get in the game, basically. You've got to pull your chair up to the table, and work your mind around these sayings. Uh, if you'll pardon me for saying this, what we're about is too important, no offense, Roger, to be left to the religious professionals. You've got to get in the game yourself, and I think that's what he wants you to do. Your standard, however, that you develop, and this is a problem I had with my title, would not be Christian. Uh, I submit to your title uh, title that your uh, your standard would be Jesuit J U uh, J U uh, where's my spelling J E S U A N and what that means is a standard pertaining what it means to be a follower of Jesus. What is the authority? Is there an authority for rejecting the Christian, uh, the, the Christian hegemony of the fourth century and developing a Jesuit standard? Uh, actually, there are two. Creeds are a late innovation, uh, innovation, and they are ideas about Jesus, and they simply don't go back to Jesus. If you read the Creed, they dispense uh, the uh, Apostles' Creed, leaps over the life and the, the, the tradition and the sayings of Jesus. What was important about him was his birth and his death. That's it. Uh, Jesus is a source, however, for what later became Christianity and should be a source, I think, for a Jesuit. That is, the historical Jesus would be your standard. I think I will pro uh, probably, st I was going to make a comment, well, I'll make a very brief comment. Uh, you really need to think some about uh, ritual acts. Uh, as far as I know, from a Baptist viewpoint, in the... Um, in the early church, there were two rituals. There was the Lord's Supper and uh, baptism. <clears throat> uh, let me do just one of those. Uh, I think I'll do the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. In the Synoptic Gospels, it's a Jewish Passover. And the last meal of Jesus where he says those immortal words, my body, my blood. In Paul, however, it becomes... Uh, showing forth the Lord's death till he comes by this, uh, by this meal that you eat with the fellowship. You anticipate the return of the Lord. And you show forth his death. Okay? The Didache says that the wine symbolized Jesus as the holy vine of David. The bread anticipated and symbolized the unity of the church. This is a second century text had nothing to do with the death of Jesus. The Gospel of John, it is not a Passover meal. Uh, Jesus washes the disciples' feet as an example of what they should do, and hence it's an exercise in humility and service. Roger, well, I've got to just, how many minutes do I have? I'm going to finish this up. You finish it up. Well, I don't want to do that, but I'll make this very quick. 
Mark has John's baptism of Jesus, as I said earlier, as a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Luke, John, uh, in Luke and John, the Gospel of John, Jesus is not baptized by John the Baptist, since it's not really a problem. What's important about his baptism is the descent of the Spirit. Uh, and Matthew, he's got that, Matthew has that immortal phrase uh, when uh, uh, John tells Jesus, uh, I, I shouldn't baptize you, you should baptize me. Jesus says, this is the way we fulfill all righteousness. But that's a special word of Matthew. It's only in Matthean material that it appears. Um, and last of all, Paul, it symbolized the believer's union in Christ as we talked about this morning. Okay, let me, let me stop right there. <coughs> You've been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.